Welcome to podcast number three in our series, Colonies to Colossus, The Rise of a Giant. In this podcast, we take a look at the colony of Virginia, England's first planting in the New World. By the time England got around to establishing her first colony in the Western Hemisphere, Spain had been in the colonizing business for nearly 100 years. English kings and queens looked on with envy as countless shiploads of treasure from the New World enriched Spain. Why should Spain be the only nation to profit from the enormous wealth waiting to be harvested in the New World? By the final decades of the 1500s, England was ready to begin colonizing, or planting as they called it. In our modern era of easy living, it is hard to fully appreciate what they went through, battling the elements just to stay alive. Carving a living out of a raw wilderness often forced them to make agonizing life and death choices. They could have no way of knowing what a great nation they were laying the foundation for. England wasn't the first European nation to attempt to colonize the eastern shore of what would become the United States. Spain had already colonized Florida, and both Spain and France had attempted settlements in what is today South Carolina, both of which failed. Spain had even attempted to establish a mission in what is today the state of Virginia in 1570, but it was destroyed by the Indians and the missionaries were killed. Imagine how different history would be if those Spanish colonies had been successful. Even after England began colonization, other European nations continued to colonize North America. There was a Swedish colony in what is today the state of Delaware, and the Dutch established several colonies in what are today the states of Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, and Delaware. All of these Dutch and Swedish colonists were eventually absorbed into expanding English settlements. Our story begins with a man named Sir Walter Raleigh, who was born in 1552. Raleigh was an adventurer, an explorer, a privateer, and a poet with big ideas. He was also friends with Queen Elizabeth. In 1584, the Queen granted Raleigh a charter, allowing him to explore and to establish settlements or plantations in the North American continent. Because Queen Elizabeth never married, she was known as the Virgin Queen. And to honor the Queen, Raleigh called the coast of North America Virginia after the Virgin Queen. At that time, the word Virginia applied to the entire east coast of what is today the United States. In 1585, the first colonists arrived and set up a small colony at the north end of what is Roanoke Island. Roanoke Island is technically within the state of North Carolina, within a few miles of Kitty Hawk, the place where the Wright brothers would do their famous first flight about three centuries later. The colony did not thrive, and starvation and disease took its toll. In fact, the next year, Sir Francis Drake arrived with a fleet of ships, He had been pillaging and plundering Spanish settlements and shipping in the Caribbean, and the colonists decided they would go back to England with Drake. This is an occasion where they had to make one of those difficult life-and-death choices. Three men had been sent out foraging, and it was not known if they would return, and the colonists decided to leave them behind, so the colony was abandoned. The following year, another attempt was made, and several boatloads of colonists came back out to reestablish the colony in the same location. In fact, in August of that year, the first Englishman born in the New World was born, and they named her Virginia Dare. Again, the colony had difficulties, and because of war with Spain and the attempt by Spain to invade England with the Armada, it was three years before supply ships would come. In 1590, supply ships from England did finally arrive in the settlement, but they found it deserted. On one of the posts, the words Croton was carved, They had an agreement that if anything happened, they would try and leave some kind of indication as to what happened to them. But no one's ever been able to solve the mystery of exactly what happened to the colonists. Perhaps they were wiped out by Indians. Some think they perhaps maybe blended or abandoned the colony and blended in with the Indians. And there were even DNA tests done in modern times to try and establish what happened to the colonists. It's still a mystery. Unfortunately for Sir Walter Raleigh, he did not fare any better than his colony. In 1618, after having fallen out of favor with the new king, James I, Raleigh was beheaded. In 1606, a group of wealthy investors formed the London Company and decided it was time to try and recolonize the New World and make some money from it. They approached the king with the idea and he granted them a charter, allowing them to colonize somewhere within the southern half of Virginia. And in modern terms, this would roughly equate the area between Florida and Pennsylvania. The investors got some ships and crammed them full of colonists and supplies and sent them on their way. And in April of 1607, those colonists arrived off what is today the Chesapeake Bay, somewhere in the neighborhood of the 
boundary between Virginia and North Carolina. After searching around, they sailed up a river, which today is still called the James River, which they named it that after the king, and selected a site that in modern terms is about halfway between the towns of Norfolk and Richmond. The reason they chose this site was because it was defensible, at least they thought it was. The company had given instructions to make sure they picked a defensible site, and because it was so far up the river, it would not be visible from the ocean, which was important because they knew they'd be vulnerable to attack not only by Indians, but other colonial powers, especially the Spanish. On May 14, 1607, they landed and set up a settlement that they called uh, after the king, we still call it Jamestown today, after the king that had given them the charter. It seemed like a defensible site because it was kind of on an island and the James River was thought to be able to provide fresh water, which sometimes it did, but it also had brackish water from the ocean at times of year. And there were times which the colonists had salt sickness or salt poisoning from drinking seawater, and they probably weren't aware of it. One of the first things the colonists did after they set up their settlement was they quickly built a fortification around this settlement that was made out of logs and branches and brambles. It was nothing fancy, but it might prevent a surprise attack. It was a good thing they did build this because less than two weeks later, about 200 Indians uh, made a concerted effort to attack the fort and try and wipe it out or attack the settlement. The casualties from this attack were minimal and the Indians were repulsed, but it persuaded the colonists they needed to take defense very seriously. They decided to build a palisade fort around the settlement. This was probably the best thing they could do considering the circumstances. A palisade fort is constructed by putting logs side by side, end into the ground first, so it kind of makes a wall of logs. Now in Europe, this would be easy to knock down with cannons or other things. The Indians didn't really have anything that could knock it down. It was a triangular shaped fort, and in each one of the corners, they put a bastion or platform in which they mounted cannons so they could fire in all directions. It took them 19 days to build the fort, which is amazing if you consider what they had to do. They had to dig 900 feet of trenches. Many of the logs they were dealing with probably would have paid, weighed 800 pounds before they were trimmed and ready. They were doing this in the summer heat with mosquitoes, and they were constantly under attack by Indians who were shooting random arrows at them from the woods, and many of the men had to stay armed while they were working. Some men were killed while building this, but they did it all in 19 days, which is amazing. If you go on Google Maps today and look at satellite view, you can still see the fort. The archaeologists have dug it up, and you can clearly see it. It's been partly rebuilt. You can see it from the air very clearly right along the edge of the James River. One of the things that they were told to do by the company was to search for gold, which they did. They didn't find any, and it probably frustrated them because Spain had found so much. They should have been able to find some as well, and they probably began to wonder if the colony was ever going to really be worth anything. They also attempted to look for a passage to Asia, and it's a testament to how ignorant they were of just what they were dealing with. They didn't really understand the size or mass of this continent that they had settled in. Instead of searching for gold, the colonists would have been wiser to worry about their food supplies. They only brought so much with them from England, and they didn't raise enough, and not long after they arrived, they ran out of food. They became desperate and started killing livestock. They even ate rats and eventually ended up eating each other, or at least the ones who had died. So there was cannibalism going on at Jamestown. Through bartering, they were able to get some food with the Indians, but this put them in a dangerous situation because they ended up having to give the Indians things such as weapons uh, in exchange for food, which made them vulnerable to Indian attacks. One of the persons who stands out during this time was a man named Captain John Smith, the story goes that he was captured by the Indians and the chief's daughter, Pocahontas, pled for his life and was able to save his life. Smith became the president of the colony and he kind of imposed tough rules and he had a no work, no eat policy. He was dealing with some of the people there that were a little higher born that felt they didn't have to work or perform manual labor. Under his leadership, it was pretty stern, but they did seem to fare a little better. One of the other people that is important during this time period is a man named John Rolfe. He later did marry Pocahontas, and he's credited for bringing tobacco to Virginia. It is true that a type of tobacco grows in Virginia naturally, but it was not very good. It wasn't, didn't taste good when they smoked it. They smoked it in clay pipes back then, 
Rolf had the idea that he would bring back a Caribbean variety that was sweeter and tasted better when smoked. Tobacco became highly profitable. In fact, the colonists grew so much tobacco that they neglected to grow food because it was so valuable. Just to give you an idea of how much the tobacco they grew, in 1614 they shipped only 2,600 pounds. Three years later, in 1617, they produced 20,000 pounds. And by 1760, all of the colonies that produced tobacco produced a total of 80 million pounds. In a way, tobacco saved the colony from bankruptcy, or at least from total disaster, because it gave them something valuable that they could grow and produce. They didn't find gold or the other treasures they were hoping to or expecting to, but tobacco did make them a lot of money. Tobacco was so valuable that they literally used it as a medium of exchange. In other words, they used it as money. England had laws prohibiting the colonies from issuing paper money called bills of credit, and they were also prohibited from coining currency. So they literally used tobacco as money. So if you were fined by a court or had to pay a bill, you could pay it in a number of pounds of tobacco. Even though tobacco would be a huge cash crop, not everyone approved of it. King James I, he was on the throne when tobacco began coming into England. He had a very negative opinion of it. In fact, he said of smoking that it was a custom loathsome to the eye, hateful to the nose, harmful to the brain, dangerous to the lungs, and in the black stinking fume thereof, nearest resembling the horrible Stygian smoke of the pit that is bottomless. Raising tobacco led to a plantation society, and this was fairly typical throughout the southern colonies as the other ones were colonized. Each plantation was kind of a autonomous, self-contained unit, much like the medieval manors had been in England. This stifled the growth of large cities or towns in Virginia. In fact, Virginia had no large cities, even at the time of the Revolution. The king and his advisors, in fact, almost to the very end, were always hoping to build large cities in Virginia so they could control it better. They felt that by having large cities, they could control the population there better. Because tobacco was so valuable, Virginia became pretty much a one-crop economy. This sometimes led to problems because government regulations imposed by England prohibited plantation owners from selling their tobacco to anyone other than English merchants. So all tobacco had to go through England. During those times when tobacco production went up, the merchants and plantation owners couldn't sell it to anyone other than English merchants, which meant that the price became depressed. And this created instability in the economy. Some of the governors of Virginia attempted to introduce diversity of crops and other kinds of commercial interest into Virginia. But really, for especially during the 1600s, Virginia remained a tobacco-producing place. Colonizing in the 1600s was a perilous task. Colonists that came over went through a seasoning time in which they had to become acclimated to the change in climate and to dietary changes. England is a relatively cool country, but if you came to Virginia or the Chesapeake or any of the southern colonies, you had to get used to warm, humid summers. Also, there were dietary changes. People coming from England were used to eating a wheat-based diet, and when they got to America, they found they were now eating a corn-based diet. These changes often led to sickness and disease. These, these conditions certainly took their toll on Jamestown during those first few years of colonization, in fact, there were times when there were only as many as five or six healthy men enough or healthy enough to bury the dead because the death rates were so high. And in fact, in 1610, they actually packed up, went back aboard their ships, intending to abandon the colony. Luckily, a arriving convoy of ships from England was coming in with supplies and new colonists. And after a brief meeting, they were talked into going back and reestablishing themselves in the colony. So Jamestown came very close to becoming abandoned, just like the earlier one on Roanoke Island had become abandoned. The high death rates also led to a certain amount of social instability. There were a lot of orphans or people or children being raised by relatives instead of their own parents, and few people knew their grandparents or extended family. One of the biggest difficulties was the lack of women in the colony. Most of the colonists in those early days were men. In fact, there were so few women in the early days that it wasn't until 1680s or 90s that the population of Virginia was reproducing itself naturally. 
Prior to that, without a constant influx of new immigrants from England, the population was constantly declining. With conditions so harsh, it's hard to imagine why people kept coming over. Certainly many of them came over for religious freedom, but many of them, probably most of them, came over for the chance to own land, to make themselves something better than they would have a chance to in Europe. They certainly wouldn't have a chance to own land in England. Even though the colony had leaders on site, the real people in control of the colony were the company men, the men who owned the company, the London Company. And they were the ones who got to determine who its governors were and many other things too. Like any company, they wanted to make money. They were constantly advertising for new settlers, promising them things such as land as well as a say in the politics of the colony. One of the things the company did to improve the situation was to allow the colonists to own private property. Up to this time, the colonists had been living kind of a communal lifestyle, trying to pool their resources, but the company decided to give them each their own plot of land so that they could develop it, and conditions improved in this situation. The other thing that the company tried to do was to try and impose English social customs and norms on the colony. They felt this would improve production and make it a fitter place to live, more organized and orderly. This meant imposing the political structure upon the colony. England had a representative House of Commons in their parliament, and the company decided that it would be good for the people of Jamestown to have their own representative assembly. The company sent a new governor over, Sir George Yeardley. Yeardley organized elections, and the people selected about 20 or so representatives who on July 30th, 1619, met with Yeardley and his counselors in the church at Jamestown. It was probably the only building big enough to hold them all at that time. This is an important precedent. England had a representative assembly called the House of Commons, and in time, all of England's colonies would have some kind of representative assembly. In Virginia, it was called the House of Burgesses. Famous people such as George Washington would serve in the House of Burgesses before the American Revolution. And it was the House of Burgesses that would lead Virginia in rebellion against the king in the 1770s. So this date, July 30th, 1619, is an important event in not only Virginia history, but in American history as well. During the English Civil War, Virginia was loyal to the king, although they tried to stay out of it. It really didn't affect Virginia very much. After Parliament won the war, the new government under Oliver Cromwell sent out some commissioners with troops and ships to Virginia, demanding that they surrender the colony and that they swear allegiance to Parliament. At first, the governor there, Berkeley, he would not swear allegiance, nor would he talk to the commissioners. And the commissioners told him that if he didn't, they would bombard Jamestown with their ships. Eventually, they were able to talk and come to some agreement, and the colony did surrender, and there was no shots fired. Really, the Civil War had very little effect upon the colony of Virginia. There were laws imposed, though, that said that anyone that would not swear allegiance to Parliament had 12 months to leave the colony. But once the commissioners left with their troops, Virginia, as it had under the kings, so it would under the Parliament, was really kind of left alone. In fact, all the English colonies were pretty much left alone by London, no matter who was in control, whether it was king or parliament. One of the events that deserves mention from the late 1600s in Virginia is an event known as Bacon's Rebellion, which occurred in 1676, ironically just 100 years before the Declaration of Independence would be signed. Bacon's Rebellion began when frontiersmen and colonists on the frontier were having troubles with the Indians, and they were angry that the governor wasn't more forceful. They wanted the governor to summon the militia and to go on retaliatory raids and move the Indians out or at least strike back. Governor Berkeley, instead of wanting to go after the Indians, he decided to build fortifications and take a kind of a defensive posture. One of the things that irritated the colonists was that Berkeley and his cronies had a kind of monopoly on the trade with the Indians, colonists felt that in order to keep this trade lucrative, Berkeley was betraying their need for safety and security. Part of the problem was the governor himself. Like all colonial governors, he used his position as governor to enrich himself in a close circle of friends and cronies to gain their loyalty. 
This was typical of colonial government and government in England, so it was nothing new for them. Since 1641, Berkeley had been governor for almost 30 years off and on, and during that time he had become arrogant and difficult to talk to. And there, were, there were incidents between him and members of the House of Burgesses. Nathaniel Bacon was one of the governor's counselors, and interestingly, he ended up leading the rebellion against the governor. They didn't get along, even though they were related by marriage. There's one stormy incident where Bacon led 400 militiamen into Jamestown, which was the capital of colonial Virginia, and they threatened the governor as well as forced the legislature, the House of Burgesses, to pass bills indemnifying them for the damage they were about to cause. And Berkeley himself had to flee the colony. He fled to Maryland for his own safety, and there was a rampage of destruction, and Berkeley's own plantation in Greenspring was burned. Luckily for Governor Berkeley, Nathaniel Bacon died during the rebellion, and the, the rebellion itself fell apart. Berkeley and his cronies then exacted revenge by burning and destroying, and Berkeley was not only doing this, he was also summarily hanging and putting to death people who had been involved in the rebellion without even so much as a trial. When news of the disorders and rebellion reached London, the king dispatched three commissioners and a thousand troops to investigate what had happened, and they ended up sending Berkeley back to London. Berkeley ended up dying, so he never really had to answer any questions about what had happened. But it made London sit up and take notice of what was happening in the colonies, and they did clamp down a little bit after that and provide a little more supervision for the colonies. It is true that many colonists came to the New World hoping to find religious freedom. Most probably came, however, with the hope of owning their own land and improving their social status. Most of the colonies were founded with the expectation that they would make money for the investors, proprietors, and companies that financed and established them. By the time of the American Revolution, Virginia had a population of about half a million people, making it the most heavily populated of the 13 original colonies, although a large portion of the Virginia population were slaves. Some of America's most important leaders came from Virginia, including George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Patrick Henry, Edmund Randolph, George Mason, and Richard Henry Lee. Eight U.S. presidents also came from Virginia, more than any other state. Without Virginia, there probably would not be a United States. For further reading on this topic, I recommend the following books, Colonial Virginia, A History, by Warren Billings, John Selby, and Thad Tate. Colonial America, A History, from 1565 to 1776, by Richard Middleton. Roanoke Island, The Beginnings of English America, by David Stick. Deputies and Liberties, The Origins of Representative Government in Colonial America, by Michael Kamen. And I highly recommend the following, Jamestown, The Buried Truth, by William Kelso.